How to Save Your Life, Go Home Safe, and Put the Bad Guys in Jail. Sean Grogan, Master of Nonverbal Communication, OneFaceTraining.com. Once again, I have the honor to interview one of the best humans in the world at what they do, and Sean Grogan is most definitely one of them. After a long career as a former special investigations detective, he began teaching classes, including unmasking hidden facial expressions and body language for law enforcement, making him a human lie detector and teaching other good people the skills he has, got, he has even gone on to write a book about. Detecting deception is the skill set, and this is something we can all learn from, because as he speaks about in the show, pre-fight cues or the actions that every human does before they attack, it can literally save your life before things get out of hand. His book, Beware the Body, print and audio book, and the link's there in the show notes, is all about this exact skill, and I'm excited to listen to it. Sean has also been certified as a trainer for the Body Language Institute in Alexandria, Virginia. Recognizing Sean's skill set, he was recruited by and worked for Joe Navarro's Body Language Academy as a mentor for the Body Language Expert Program. The role of mentor has allowed him to spread his knowledge to people around the world, including four different continents. Traveling throughout the United States since 2019, Sean provides training to law enforcement on nonverbal communication, giving detectives, officers, investigators, and agents the advanced skills that can be used in a variety of settings. He has received a very large amount of positive feedback from many that have taken his courses. His book, Beware the Body, gives insight into aggression and aggression detection utilizing body language. A true officer and gentleman, it was a pleasure to speak with Sean and you'll love this show on so many levels. You can find Sean at onefacetraining.com, his book on the links in the show notes. On LinkedIn, uh, links down there below as well, Sean Grogan, and uh, I put the link for Sean Grogan Body Language for Instagram. Thanks for watching. Hi, thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces Operator, and check out my new project for 2023 at hownottodie.com.au where I've combined all my special forces training and police officer experience to help others. Thanks for watching. And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast. And thank you to my guest today, Sean Grogan. Sean, thanks for jumping on. Thanks for having me, Danny. You're welcome, man. Look, I'll, I'll do a, a small intro. I don't normally do these things. Uh, right at the start, definitely in the show notes, and you've got amazing um, bio to put in the show notes. So you've been a Marine, which we'll speak about. You've been in the police force for, I think you said, well over a decade. Um, former uh, detective, former canine handler uh, and gang investigator. But what I'm really, in, oh, and also author, I mean, wow, <laughs> your, your book, Beware the Body, I'm, I'm definitely going to be reading this and, and look into a lot more. Uh, what you're really well known for is, I think, being a human lie detector. Would that kind of be right? More, more of a body language analyst, I would say. I wouldn't say human lie detector. I mean, there's you use body language as a tool to assist us to ask questions. Is the way Absolutely, I, I love that. And you know, you've gone, you've been traveling through the United States since 2019 for so the last two or three years. Uh, you're you're teaching other law enforcement nonverbal communication, uh, giving uh, all the detectors and investigators those advanced skills. Uh, you know, unmasking hidden facial expressions is one of your classes. Body language for law enforcement, and another. This really intrigues me. Um, you know, as we said before, I was a police officer, not for too long here, but one thing that blew me away in the police academy, um, uh, Sean was. 93%, and I've looked into these stats, it's not exact, but 93% of uh, all language is nonverbal. I mean, that's a huge statistic. So maybe you could step off there. And, and what got you into the, you know, reading body language, reading facial expressions, um, that's obviously a passion and uh, a skill of yours. Where did that kick off? Well, I'd like to go over that statistic real quick, if you yes. don't mind me covering yes. that. Thank you. That statistic, and that's something I had read very often as well, 93%, 93%. Yeah. 
And when you look at where it comes from, because I'm, I'm kind of curious when I heard it, like, how do they quantify that? And it came from two studies back in 1967, one involving tone of voice and the other one involving positive, neutral, and negative facial expressions. Mm -hmm. And they clustered them together somehow and came up with this number. <laughs> and the guy that the guy that did the study says, yeah, I, I don't understand how they got this number. They just got it. <laughs> and you hear other numbers as well, but that's the one you always hear is that 93% yeah. actually cover that in class. I started getting into this with interviewing people. I'd interviewed countless people. I had a, a, a decent background in getting the courses of instruction, going to classes for interview interrogation as well. But I felt like something was missing. There was more out there. So I started reading a lot of books on psychology. I want to find out why people do what they do, say what they say. One of the books talked about this Dr. Paul Ekman, who was using the facial action coding system to recognize there were seven universal emotions in the face. He was really analyzing facial expressions. So I was like, wow, I got to find this training. Couldn't find it for law enforcement. Went over to Europe, got trained in it, got licensed to bring it back to the States. Mm -hmm. Started classes from there. And then I started taking more trainings on body language. Once you really learn how to just pay attention to looking at someone's body and what they do and the changes in baseline behavior. After that, it's you pick up on things that you're not getting told anywhere. You're learning it out on the street in real time during field interviews and in the box in the formal interviews as well. Wow. Whereabouts in Europe did you train, Sean? England, Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. I went to, I actually have to go again next month to Italy for a higher level training. For the yeah, for the same nonverbal communication. So I've been I've been to Europe twice, Ukraine and England. I feel like I'm missing everything in between. I got to start. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, it was a bit of a loaded question, or because as a police officer, you very quickly learn to discern um, people in general. You learn to discern the, their uh, their patterns. Um, generically stereotyping people and so on, which are, unfortunately you, you kind of have to do as a police officer. But, you know, you went from on the street, those skills to actually formally training uh, in it. And you've been traveling the world. Uh, sorry, you've been traveling all around your country for, you know, two or three years now, uh, teaching other people. I'm kind of intrigued. It's a big country. How come you're uh, training these other um, agencies in that? Is that because of your higher skill set? What's uh, happening there? Yeah, no one else is really doing this. And we don't do that in academies. I don't know how the, the academy is over in Australia, but in the United States, it's very, very, very basic. And it's not the fault of the instructors. They get loaded stuff down by the politicians, right? Like, oh, we want you to cover community policing and being nice to people for a full week. They don't care as much about our safety. I'm not talking about the instructors. They do for yep. the most part, you know, the overwhelming majority. I'm talking about the politicians. They just, Hey, we need this covered and that so we can tell our constituents a, B and C is getting covered in the police Academy. But then things like this are getting missed. And I have that training that other officers never received. I put it into practice and then I started traveling the United States doing classes. I joined up last January with one of the largest companies in the U.S. street cop training. And I've been training under them since January of 2022. I also went last August into Australia and working on an international program with one of the former U.S. Department of Defense, Defense officials over there. I'm doing an interactive online program that will be available around the world. And it, it's, it's pretty interesting when you look at the different aspects of policing and, and tactics and your approach of the vehicle, because a lot of the times here we talk about the passenger side approach, but a passenger side approach is different for you in Australia than it is for, for us, because yep. then you might, you would get placed into traffic. It's, it, I it had a hard time even wrapping my head around <laughs> it when we were doing the program, because I'm so used to driving on the right side of the road. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's, We'll go right. We won't say correct. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's yeah. that's intriguing. So, how do, how was it? And this is probably for the veterans and for the people looking at taking their skills if they're looking at career changing. How was it going from, um, you know, a paycheck uh, as a police officer to actually having to sell yourself out there? Were people sort of screaming for what you do, or do you have to do you have to go out there and sell yourself a little bit, Sean? 
A little bit of each. A lot of what I did was I was already getting classes filled up when I started after COVID things changed a little. However, I was working on the job still as a, as a cop and doing the classes. And I got to the point where I was gone, you know, more than I should be coming back working. And I'm like, this is too much. So the, I made the decision. I'm going to jump in all in, you know, it could fall apart. Like anything else, like you said, it, it is very risky. It's one of those things I had to really sit down and think about, talk over with my wife, like, hey, what do you think yeah. we do this? And then the thing is, as well, I always said, if I needed to, I could go back and I could be a cop again. I would do it in another state. I'm in New Jersey. I would go out to Texas or Florida, one of the more law enforcement friendly states yeah, and be an officer there. But it was one of those things you can always, not always, but I can go back in. I'm still healthy, relatively healthy, ready to go. If I need to, I'll, I'll go back in and start working as a cop again. So I guess then the question is, how is it going? It's been, you've been a couple of years out now. How's business? It's good. It's good. I can't complain. I did 64 classes last year and I'm looking to schedule just as much or, or more this year. That's not counting conferences where I speak for an hour or two. And I've got other things going, like I said, with the international program which has been in the works for two years now and on top of that there's some stuff might be going with another company that uh, not might we're, it's in the works it's probably going to happen for some information provide for school shootings wow and uh some of it's kind of like when you think of uh, have you read left to bang uh no i only heard a little bit about it okay yeah it's it's looking for something the the, the indicators before the explosion before something goes bad and that's kind of what their their main theme is as a company when it comes to school shooters things to look for before because there's always the aftermath and everybody looks at okay mm. what could have done what could have done but if there's a lot of things that isn't really put out there from my understanding to educators even to law enforcement there's not much except for hey once there's already an active shooter once that bang goes off we're going in there to go do what has to be done yeah, absolutely. It's a, a horrible situation to have to to think that it occurs, but you can't put your head in the sand because it does occur. Let's um, I've, I've kind of painted the picture of of how you got to where you are now, and I'm sure the listeners are, are going, "Well, okay, so how do you tell these things? You know, uh, body language, facial expressions." You wrote a book, "Beware the Body." Could you talk around "Beware the Body," and then I might just sort of pick into little places and give the listeners an idea of how to how to tell if someone's lying or what what those giveaways are those tells uh, well the, but where the body is more on aggression detection the pre-attack indicators yeah that's where, where i wanted to I kick really, off yeah um yeah I, i'm sort of leading into it and the reason why is with the the my online stuff with the how not to die it's we've got things about pre-fight indicators fancy words for know the person's going to be a danger to you before um they are in your face sort of thing yeah, yeah. And as I've seen some of the videos you have up, it's pretty, you know, they're, they're chilling to watch, but it's, there's no, you see people don't have that situational awareness. No. It's kind of, you know, I, I touched on that slightly in Beware the Body, the mm -hmm. situational awareness, but it's a lot on body language. Yep. A, a lot of the basics, then I get into aggression, and then I get into the pre-attack indicators and things such as foreshadowing where if, if, I don't know if they use that term. I'm sure you use the term. You guys pretty much use all the terms. You have more terms than we have, like Utes <laughs> for pickup trucks. And But the, the term foreshadowing in the U.S., I'm, I'm sure it's the same, same for you guys, for literature and movies and books, is a hint or a clue what's to come in the future. With body language, it's the body's way of letting you know what it's going to do before it does it. Does it happen every time? Absolutely not. But you get people that'll... I foreshadow, continue looking towards an area. They might start to get up, stop, and then they'll get up a second after. They're thinking about it. The body's not starting to move. The mind's not concrete in what they're going to do. And there's other things that they occur during everyday movements. But when there's a, we need to take things into context. If we have a situation where someone's walking towards us, looks over their shoulder, lifts their pants up, there's a good chance they're coming towards you. They might be getting ready to fight you, attack you, take something from you. That's Those are some of the pre-attack indicators that I go over. Now, could someone's pants be falling down? Sure. But if I'm in a parking lot of a 
supermarket or a, you guys have Kohl's in Perth? Yeah, yeah, he noted. <laughs> yeah, so you're in the parking lot of the Kohl's and someone's coming towards you, looking over the shoulder. You see this very often prior to attacks and the great apes do it as well. It's a look away. What are you, they don't want you to see it coming. So, you, and they're not saying, oh, I need to look away. It's just something people do. And what are you thinking? You're looking at them going, oh, they looked away from me. They're not a threat. They're not even looking towards me. That they look back, they're a couple steps away, and now they've got that pants lift too, preparing themselves to do battle. And then cops do it as well. If you could think back when you were on the job, you start going in and you get that call for, hey, we got 30 people fighting at the club. Okay, you meet up, everybody gets out. You watch all these cops lifting up their duty belts. <laughs> duty belts not going anywhere. You know, you've got the belt keepers on, but it's just a habit that people have before they go and do something physical like fight, lifting those pants. And for cops, they see it before they ru people run all the time too. Not so much a concern with civilians unless you're that boring that people might try to run away from you while you're talking. To <laughs> wow. And really, as you're saying, I'm just thinking we're just basic cavemen at heart, aren't we? Yeah, yeah we really are. When you, when you really break it down, that's people forget we're animals, we're mammals. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting what you said about the pre-fight indicator. And I was thinking back to Tony Blau, what, what an interesting cat he was on the show. And he is so often quoted as saying, you know, anybody that's been in a, a, a confrontational situation, a violent situation, looking back, they always had a feeling something was off. They had a feeling something was off. And so often, especially the females, you, the females are trained out of reacting to their feelings you know that's not so bad that guy's doing that and it's horrible because females have got great instincts at reading things but those are the sort of things you're talking about aren't they that we realized something was off but couldn't put our finger on it yeah and that's that's one of the things i go over you hit the nail on the head there having that feeling talk about the hair on the back of your neck stands up and it could be maybe you picked up on a micro facial expression that you couldn't explain to yourself at the time maybe you noticed pre-attack indicators subconsciously but you're, it's a lot better to be able to articulate, this is something that's off, something that's wrong. I should get my hands up now, gain proximity distance if I need to, or plan a, a way to fight or flight, or at least have a plan, depending on who you are, the situation, what are you going to do? Okay, this is a good chance this person is going to swing at me. There's a good ch per, uh, chance that someone's going to pull a knife on me, gun, any such thing. There's things, The I go over blading a lot, Yeah. which... There, I go over three types, a slight blade, that one shoulder back. It's when you carry a weapon. As a cop, your interview stance. And for the for the listeners, it's just turning your body side on slightly so you're less of a frontal, um, big, big target to hit. Correct, exactly. You think of a knife blade. If you have a knife blade, the flat side towards you, you turn the blade more and you see less of the, that knife blade. And you could have a prominent blade where you're standing at about 90 degree angle where the person's giving the shoulder towards you. That's also an issue. If I start moving around that person, they continue to blade. Well, my height and awareness is going to go up. Yeah. I'm like, well, there's more of a threat. And then I go over an enhanced blade, which is a blading with a hand in a pocket, using the other hand to do what's known as illustrating speech. When we talk very often, we move our hands. Right. Not everybody does, but a lot of people. And most people move both hands. Now there's people with disabilities and nothing's 100%. But if I have someone with one hand in a pocket, blading towards that side, keeping it away from me, and using the other hand to illustrate speech, well, now I'm going to be really concerned because why is someone moving that way towards me? When we talk about it in law enforcement terms about possibly seeking cover and then calling out commands, but it's something you need to think about in uh, as a civilian. If you don't carry a weapon on a day-to-day -day basis or you're not prepared to fight someone if you need to, if they pull out that weapon, we know how quickly things happen. There's that video have you seen out in, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Damien, it's Brisbane or Brisbane, Australia? Yeah, yeah it's Brisbane. pretty pretty close. I'm a Kiwi, so you can you can butcher these names for Australians as much as you want, but it's Brisbane. <laughs> Brisbane, okay. Thanks. So Brisbane, I don't know how many of the listeners have seen it, but if you go Google Brisbane mall stabbing, you see the guy, have you seen this one where a guy stabs the guy? In the oh, and it just ironically there was a bunch of kiwis fighting it was a crazy one um is that where he gets stabbed straight in the neck and, and bleeds out yeah yeah that's one of those things you know people 
don't realize how quick things happen. Mm -hmm. And I hear this from civilian friends of mine that have never been in the military or police. And I'm like, I can't believe how quick something, well, that's, that's what happens. It's very lowly, very rarely a slow burn. Things happen like that. Yeah, that was horrendous. And for those people that are, um, aren't aware of it, um, a, a, two groups were, uh, it was actually in around a bit of some shopping center around a train station, I think. And um, one one was advancing, one was retreating these groups. There was a lot of posturing, but one big guy just ego just went, I'm just getting so big. I'm going to take these guys on. And he got stabbed in the neck like a jab, like a Muhammad Ali jab. And unfortunately, obviously, the guy had a knife and he was literally dead 15 seconds later. Ego will get you killed. And I love what you're talking about here, Sean, is actually watch that person because you don't know what they've got in their hand as they're standing to the side onto you as you're saying blading. You don't know what they've got in their mind. You don't know what they pre-planned there. Um, what about domestic situation? You don't know what's going on in case that person's flipped, you know, They've never put hands on you, but there's been a lot of conflict for, for years. And then maybe one day that they, they snap, you've, you've still got to be switched on in these situations. And I think what you're talking through there, be where the body is absolutely brilliant and, and worth, worth the read. Thank you. Yeah, it's one of the things that it, it should be covered more, not just in law enforcement, but in life. If you yeah. said domestic situations, someone has a partner that that's home and they're, you know, never, woman's never been hit by the husband. And one day they drink a little bit too much whiskey or something and just, that's it. Now, again, for listeners, it's, it's so nice to be able to speak to um, a, a fellow police officer and military. Um, for the listeners, we, and especially you, Sean, don't speak from theory. You've seen these things, I'm sure, hundreds of times in your career. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. I never saw an enhanced blading, though. As I said, that's one of those things. But we've seen the look over the shoulder. You see that lifting of the pants. And that's one thing for, for law enforcement as well. Look over, People look a decent amount and run off. And I, always, I always talk about, you bring up that this stuff that we've seen. We kind of understand out in public, people looking around, what are they looking for? <laughs> it's not something, you know, it's usually cops, former military, former victims of violence. Yeah. And criminals. Who else is looking around? Most people are staring at their cell phone while they're walking through that parking lot. They're not, yeah. they don't have that situation awareness. Now, if I get someone looking up, they're looking around, they're aware of themselves, I'm gonna take note. But if I get someone milling around an area in a public park, convenience outside a convenience store, what are you milling around for? There, there's a chance they're going to meet a friend that borrowed their video game. However, there's a, there's also a better chance. I know this from working special investigations, you're milling around waiting to meet your drug dealer yeah. or looking for an opportunity to steal something from somebody. And if you're out there waiting for a drug dealer and an opportunity comes, comes across where someone looks like they're looking like they're not paying attention, you might be able to get something from them. That might happen as well. I'm so glad you went down that route. I was, I was probably going to lead you into it. So if we talk about predators, bad guys, and in our policing, we were taught there was uh, three types. There was the mad, bad, sad persons, you know, and these people are bad. They're criminals, petty criminals, but getting punched in the face or, or mugged is still life changing for the average person. So picking the predator or the bad guy picking their victim I watched uh, some videos with uh, convicted felons and they would play them videos of people and go, okay, which one of these ones would you, would you rob, would you attack? And I think 10 times out of 10, they picked the weaker, they picked the unaware type people than the person who was watching or was walking confidently. Um, it's not going to save your life, but immediately it then filtered out you as a victim. Can you speak to that a little bit, please, Sean? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually go over one of the studies where they did that in the 80s in the, in the book. In my book, I go over one of the studies. They took criminals that were incarcerated, they're in prison, and they all the criminals that they sat down with had attacked people they did not know on the street. So they went you know, to, to mug them, to steal stuff and things like that. So what they did was they started choreographing people in a high crime area in New York City. 
I was, I'm sorry, not Corey. They started filming yep. all the people, and then they brought in choreographers and and they they wrote up about their movements, right? And they found those things about people that were different than others. And what do I mean by that is they would walk differently. You think of the overwhelming majority of people walk, they move the left foot forward and the right arm, and then they'll go left arm forward, right foot. Well, the people there are people out there, and you'll see them if you pay attention, that will move that one side at the same time and the other side at the same time. They also talked about people that bounce up and down. We call it in the military here, diddy bopping. <laughs> diddy bopping versus walking in a more figure eight fashion. And all these things they broke down, and they found that things like that would raise the chance of one of these criminals wanting to attack a person. Oh, wow. And that Or find them to be, not just want to attack, but find them to be an easier victim than someone they would choose. Yeah. And you bring that up about a weak person and these different movements. And it, listen, people have disabilities. I understand that. And, you yeah. know, we've all been there with even just knee injuries where you're crutching around and doing things. But when you're out there, you think of a, a predator. What do they do? Do they go after the healthy, big buffalo? No, they find that buffalo that stands out from the rest of the buffalo. And that's what these people do as well. There were mammals, they're mammals. They're finding something that's off from everybody else. And the wolf, the wild African dog, the wild, any kind of with hyenas, other kind of predators that, you know, any kind of yep. predator out yep. there, the lion, they're all going to go after something that is not as hard as the entire pack. Easy it's, prey. You know, the, easy prey. Yeah, easy prey. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. It, it totally makes sense and, and comes back to what we said sort of 10 minutes ago about us being mammals and sort of cavemen at heart. We are simple, simplistic creatures. Uh, and, and that's why I teach what I, I do at the actual hands-on level. It can't be skill-based. Uh, Tony Blair with the, the spear stuff, the same. It's, it's not skill-based, it's instinct-based. It's what you naturally do as a flinch. Wow, that's, um, that's brilliant. I had no idea we were going this way. Let's maybe transition to where, what you're teaching um, which has always intrigued me since I, I've watched the first Alan Peace, believe he's Australian, on body language sort of 20, 25 years ago. Um, let's talk about how you can discern if, um, people's, as you said, microfacial expressions, body language and so on for telling lies, for, for, the, for the person who's not telling the truth. What, what goes on there? And I'm actually thinking it's probably the same sort of thing, those 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 pre-fight indicators they can't sort of stop themselves from doing it yeah you're looking for detecting deception you're looking first when I, I deal with someone i'm looking for a baseline behavior and then i'm looking for changes in those baseline behaviors so if i've got someone i've been speaking with for 30 minutes and i haven't heard them sniffle at all it doesn't appear that they have sinus issues cold allergies and all of a sudden they I ask them a, que a direct question and i get yeah well i was over here at this point oh well, I got more questions now. I'm not, I can't say the person's lying. They might okay. not like what I ask them, but I'm looking for deviations from the behavior. Now, if we've been speaking for 30 minutes and I've seen you perform five rapid nose inhales at various times, yep. not in correlation with me asking something, well, then you, you might have a, an allergy or something. I'm also going to pay attention to things like people grabbing the neck. This is a very sensitive part of the body. There's not much meat here. You've got the windpipe, carotid artery, jugular vein, and the, did I say the spinal cord? The spinal cord. Yeah. You've got, there's a lot of stuff in here. When people are stressed out, very often they'll grab here. It doesn't mean someone's lying. Yeah. So what I'm looking for is, I don't want to call them tells, but more like cues. Okay, something's off here. I need to ask more questions. That's interesting. Um, so for me, me, I'm uh, four days. I've been vertical after having about three days flat, at smashed out on COVID. <laughs> so uh, yeah, oh, wow. a little bit, a little bit nasally. The nose is bleeding this morning from um, things. So yeah, great pickup. Um, let me see. I read an interesting book by a CIA guy, and I can't remember his name. Sorry, when I say read, it's an audio book. Phenomenal um, uh, read about. 30 years in the CIA of what he could speak to. And he, at one stage, was being investigated by the FBI um, and had to take so many polygraph tests or his 
the layman's know, lie detector tests. Um, have you worked with lie detector or polygraph machines and do you then weave that in with your own investigator skills, your own um, uh, questioning, or do people that run those things literally just run it as a machine? No, they... That's, I got a lot to speak on the polygraph. So where I worked and where I live in New Jersey, it's illegal for an employer to compel an employee to utilize a, a polygraph. And if I remember correctly, in Australia, when I talked to a New South Wales detective, it, it's illegal in Australia as well. Yeah, we, we don't. I don't think we use them here at all. But it just intrigued me that CAA and FBI were that they. You know, they're pretty clever people. They're pretty big organizations. They literally were reliant on these polygraph machines. Yeah, they they have them. And one of the instructors that teaches interview interrogation for street cop training, we've had discussions about it. He was trained in it as well. Now, when I say it's illegal for an employer to compel an employee, it doesn't mean you can't say, hey, give me a polygraph. Yeah. And it's also can be used on criminals. Now, it's not use that often at least from what i've dealt with and it's not just like you asked is it someone just getting using the machine no when you talk to any of these instructors i've had a bunch of the instruct the uh, polygraph examiners from around the country come to class or sometimes it's not the only job they do it's you know they have other things that i've had secret service agents or polygraph examiners and state local county agencies and they all tell me it's as good as the examiner themselves. Right. As a polygraph examiner. And you know, I was told that by a couple of them. So now I ask all of them. I'm like, do you agree? And they're like, yeah, 100 percent You don't just hook up to that. It's not like you said, a lie detector when calls it that. It's not. It doesn't go ding ding ding. We got a liar. It's saying, hey, there's something off here. Something's not right. It's inconsistent with other things. And it me measures physiological changes in the body, which we can't see which is pretty cool. And yeah. that's another way to help you to ask more questions and realize, okay, maybe something's off here. And that's what I've gathered. Like I said, I've never, I never used one. I never had to do it. I never got hooked up to one because a lot of cops in the U S depending on the state and the agency will be hooked up to one to get hired. That's really interesting. It was, I was just thinking through your career there, where you've got to now. I mean, you're an expert in, human expression, uh, body language, a whole bunch of things there. But you've gone from the Marines to being a, a street cop to a, a canine handler, dog handler. And, and where you are now, that, I was just thinking, that's such a progression. Um, looking back, Sean, you must sort of be a, bit, a little bit mind blown that, you know, you're in the military, you're, you're deployed overseas, and now you're here. Um, it, it is quite the journey, man. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it started out pretty rough too. When I was eighteen, I went to so you bring up the Marines. I, I started out in Paris Island. I shouldn't say people always have it rougher, but to be at eighteen for me, it was it was one of those experiences that I'm always going to stick with me. I got my knee popped out when I was in Paris Island, so Marine Corps boot camp, um, right. trained to eight. So I spent six months there, and the Marine Corps in the U.S. doesn't give a shit if you're if you're hurt. You know, they're not taking it easy on you. Yeah. I was so for an extra three months, you know, you're not sitting around watching TV. You're going from chow to chow to chow. And I was on crutches. We had crutch around and, and field day clean every morning, clean the barracks, the, the squad bay. And then yeah. you would sit on a footlocker and read military knowledge. So for three months, it was like being in purgatory. I couldn't wait to go back to training <laughs> for three. It was one. Do they use those terms in yeah. New Zealand? Uh, field, uh, Foot Locker and, and Field Day? Oh, that... Same same stuff. So uh, we, we have with a trunk rather than a foot locker and uh, field. We're always in the field. Oh, <laughs> which I believe that word's been banned in uh, University of California. Is that right? Uh, not allowed to say field anymore. <laughs> uh, it's California. You never know what's going to happen out there. What? <laughs> <laughs> the word field is i gotta look that up because they've been banning words left and right over there i don't yeah it's a true story <laughs> true story oh man it's you bring up field day though that's one of the things we use that as a term for when you're in elementary school here for oh. a day where you go outside and like play sports and stuff like yeah. that so yeah. like one day a year they did it and i'm like 
a field day. And they kept my first week in Paris Sunday, like, we're going to field day this Sunday, field day, field day. And I'm like, field day? Like, my father was in the Marines, too. He never, and he always talked about, you know, how structured and, and tough it was. And, like, it's not, I'm like, what, did, what are they going to do? Like, we're we playing baseball outside? Yeah. And we started cleaning, and then I realized, oh, this is the field day. This is <laughs> This is what they're talking about. <laughs> oh pain no. so for us in the field is just straight out into the bush doing our field stuff and we'd have the camp soldier versus the field soldier and both sort of hated each other like the camp soldier the guy who loved loves doing ironing and field soldier loves being dirty uh, and uh never the twain shall meet sort of thing yeah well, we use that term too like going out in the field when you're in the field and that, that's funny because you get the we call them in Iraq, fobbits. Have you ever heard that term? Oh, that's a clever term. Um, blanket stackers was one we'd use, or or um, pogs, uh, I think, was one as well. But yeah, I can see where you're going with with fobbits. Yeah, if I like stay on the fob, but yeah, pogue in the Marines, the word pogue was very anybody that wasn't infantry. So I wasn't infantry, so I'd be a pogue to any to to yourself and any other infantryman or special forces because I was artillery and, and then I was motor T. So even though it was a combat MOS and artillery, it was still, nah, you're, you're a pogue, you're a pogue. Uh, because at the no end of the day, we weren't humping, you know, going on. Do you guys call them that as well, the humps? Oh, yeah, just different words. Um, uh, pack march or... or, or... Depends. Because we've got so many um, British as well, British and, and Aussie, just all the slang sort of gets combined. Oh, okay. And it's it seems yeah. to get very tribal as well. It's interesting what you say there, just again for the veterans... <laughs> and definitely from the regular army side you got that um us versus them mentality and you got the you know i'm better than a pogue and so on all these sort of things but as soon as you hit special forces and you were selected for that that human humility that, that was just gone and i remember specifically uh sean uh i mean it takes seven support staff to get one operator on the ground that's the bottom line one operator cannot do the job without seven other people getting them there and one of them will be the, sorry, not sure of the number, but many of them be from the Q store, from the, you know, for the, the civilian listeners, from the supply people. We had one supply girl. She was a young girl at, our, at the time. And everybody at the unit was just amazing at their job. And that's all we care about is that people can do their job. And she was so good at our job. She was just our sister. We would treat her as an absolute equal because we see it for her worth of what she is. And special forces taught me humility and and um, and seeing that person um, not in a tribal way, but as their own entity. And, and we don't care what color you are, what race you are, what what sexuality you are. As long as you can do the job, you stand beside us. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's something. And I guess you would say the regular part of the branches. There was a lot of. Uh, you're a pogue, you're, you know, fobbit, things like that. And it, it was met in jest for the most part. You know, yeah. it wasn't, it is what it is. But like you brought up the, would you, you said the camp soldiers? Yeah. Is that what you guys, yeah, that's, that's something, you know, you're in a combat zone and you, you go back, you're on a base, you're about to go in a chow hall and someone wants to know why your sleeves are a certain way. And it's like, <laughs> you know, depending on how, what mission you just came back from, it's like, you really gotta you really gotta do that to us like can we just go eat i don't want to play these games because you've been sitting on a base just worried about rockets and mortars and, and nothing else all day yeah now let's touch on that you were in the marines you deployed where did you deploy to and what was it like coming back from the deployment back into the states and back into um sort of a peacetime country i was in 05 i was in iraq yeah wow well, it's a tough time iraq. then yeah, because it was just after Fallujah, yeah. and it, I didn't even realize until I started reading more. I just read one of uh, Jocko's books. I didn't, I didn't realize that in 06, that Ramadi had kicked off to that, that in 06, because I was there in 05, and it was just mines and IDs everywhere. I mean, it was nonstop with it. You couldn't go on a convoy, and I shouldn't say you couldn't. Every once in a while, you go on a convoy without a minor ID, without someone trying to kill you with those it was, it, it was, I don't want to say difficult coming back, you know, because there are guys that had obviously a lot worse than I did and saw worse things. It wasn't, it's just, 
it's a it's a culture shock coming back, right? Like yes. you have that culture shock going over there, then you return home, and there's a culture shock of people are just living like no one really seemed to to care a great deal. But not not that there weren't people that cared, but it's just it's a it's a culture shock going there and then coming back and being reintroduced to the world. I haven't, I, don't, I haven't spoken to a veteran about this, I think. I mean, generally, when veterans come on the show, there's a different angle, different different things. I mean, we had Chris Van Sant on the other day, and our angle was more about transition and, and mental health. Chris Van Sant was um, one of the team that captured Saddam Hussein. But it's so true, the, the culture shock of coming back. So I found coming back from East Timor, the value of human life. I mean, I'd see a five-year-old girl with her three-year-old brother on her hip and on her other hand, she's carrying a, a four liter bottle of water, you know, women carrying bags of rice on their heads, the, the, how these people live. And then I came back to uh, the world as it were. And there was, I was in a cafe. I remember seeing these um, entitled um, spoilt in my mind um, people and going, you've just got no idea what where I've come from and how other people are living, how hard they've got it. And it was just a real shock. And it for me, I had to really, as a younger man, grip up my brain to to not be resentful of them. Yeah, I think you, you put it very well there. And I listened to the podcast you had with Marcus Anderson, if I recall. Oh, Marcus, Marcus Aurelius Anderson. Yeah, wow. Aurelius, yes, yeah. Yeah, and you guys touched upon this as well about, you know, you can, like people don't realize in this first world countries what it's like. My wife's from Ukraine, which is wow. you know, a sec yeah, a second world country, I would say. And yeah. we were there, I was there 10 years ago. She was 17 when she came here. And it's, you know, when we went over there, she was like, you can, can you believe the roads here? And I was like, I was in Iraq. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I hadn't been. But if you took an American that had never been out of the first world they might oh what's going on here you know it's or or an australian or or someone from yeah. from great britain it's it's that shock like you said there's just that there's no understanding like this this woke stuff that goes around the world now like it drives me nuts like but there's got to be some common sense to, to certain things where if you don't if you're not happy where you are or that's we get a, some anti-americans that live in america that uh, I'm just like, okay, if you don't like it, you know, it's it's very trite saying, oh, if you don't like it, go somewhere else. And I understand it's not that simple, but go somewhere else and see what it's like to go be in, in a second world or third world country. And then you can appreciate and be grateful for what we have here. And I just don't want that messed up where we live. And I'm sure you feel the same about where you're yeah. at. I don't want that to be ruined due to other ideologies. So I'm not saying we can't improve and make things better, but we have it good here. And if you don't think that, go to a second or third world country. It really does change. And I think people should travel and travel in those countries. I remember traveling as a civilian to Vietnam and Laos. And we started in Kuala Lumpur. So we started in Kuala Lumpur, um, which was very rich. And then going to Laos, which was like, a, you know how it is, dirt roads and so on. It's it's really helpful for your growth as a human. And, and I think your empathy towards others as well. You did you you did marines you did your tour and then police how did you fall into police i actually was working in a water company as a laborer when i got back for a little bit shortly after i got back from iraq and then i i was as a, i was a laborer and a lot of the laborers actually two of them that that were there became cops and i was in iraq with these guys because i was in a reserve unit that i deployed with so right. I knew these guys, and they're like, oh, it's a great job. You know, you get that camaraderie again. Yep. So then I went into the police force, and that was, it was really cool because there was a lot of Marines that were in the, it was in a 200, about 220 uh, officer department. It's a little different here, obviously, than Australia, which is yep. these giant agencies. So when, when I was there, maybe there was 30, maybe even 40 Marine veterans, probably wow. closer to 40. Yeah, there were a lot of Marine veterans. We had Marine Corps balls, which is for the Marine Corps birthday every year. And there was also, and they were big when I started. And we also had a lot of, you know, Army, Navy, Air, U.S. Air Force. And there's there's a decent amount of bets because in the state of New Jersey, 
you get what's called veterans preference. Yeah. Most of the country, if you take a civil service job, they call it like police or fire, you, you get a few points, but New Jersey, this is one thing they do, right? I usually, you know, I, I jump down Jersey's throat as far as <laughs> a state and the way it's set up, but it's, they actually give, in my opinion, it's a good thing. They give veterans preference overall. So if you take the test, you score low, as long as you pass, you go higher than the person that scores a hundred on the test. Nice. Wow. And I can see yeah. why. I mean, back when uh, a lot of the military were transitioning into civilian uh, roles and people were trying to find their find their feet in the space. So I remember um, some sort of recruiting companies saying how much value a veteran can bring to a place. You know, they, they've got self-discipline. They've got these, um, these skills. They're not they're gonna, not going to go shooting guns and, and put war paint on in the office, but they can bring problem solving skills. They can bring a whole bunch of basic things that maybe someone uh, is still learning, uh, on, you know, in, in their life. So it's really cool that that happens in, um, in America and specifically in New Jersey. Yeah, really cool. So you, you made yeah. them to the, uh, the police yeah, and I, I was on, on the road for two and a half years. I went to special investigations, which is narcotics. Straight away. Things. Uh, two and a half years in. Yeah, that's oh, pretty quick, it. though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, you actually can go, and I love that term straight away because I, I got <laughs> confused by that when I was in Australia. Someone said straight away, and it was with someone moving. I'm like, you want me to run that way? <laughs> we don't use that much. We say right away. So I'm like, <laughs> so yeah, uh, two and a half years. And then I went in there as what they, they call them rotators, 90 days, you get 90 days to rotate through and then go back to patrol unless an opening came up. When I was there, an opening came up and I ended up staying. And then after a couple more years in there, I ended up getting the canine, which was pretty cool. That was, that's probably the best, uh, the most rewarding job in law enforcement, in my opinion, at least with what I've done. I'm sure there's other, you know, you end up, working I mean, sex crimes I, I i don't think mentally i can handle it but if you're working what is it called the anti-trafficking units i'm sure that's very very rewarding as well I and mean, that's another you know that's a, a hard job to deal with yeah. as far as the everyday job with a dog it was fantastic yeah definitely um so i'll tell you a story about canine and we call them dog handlers in new zealand uh, a lot of um, civilians don't realize that a dog handler is uh, just one cop and one dog in a car. And normally you got your partner um, beside you and is a regular police officer. Over here, they're, they're so weak, <laughs> Sean, they, they have to go three police in a car often. It's insane. And, and coming from my country, where a lot of policing was done with one constable in a car, depending on which city you're in, Auckland is a higher threat. But anyway and aside go back to the, the the dogs in the special forces uh many times we'd have operators go out um and sit in that passenger seat with it with a police officer to learn more skills uh often in ambulances we'd have an operator go in an ambulance and sit in the ambulance and learn more skills and it was brilliant it was brilliant exposure but i had a great time with um my dog handler buddies uh, in Auckland, uh, absolutely phenomenal stuff to learn. This, <laughs> this was an amazing story. Uh, we were going to a guy with a sword. Now, maybe that's not a big thing in America because everybody's tooled up with guns, but this was a big thing in New Zealand. We, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night. This guy's in South Auckland, which is like the, the ghettos, the badlands, and this guy's got a sword. And we're flying to this down the, um, uh, the motorway, we were passing other cop cars, not just a little bit fast. We were doing about 200 k's an hour to get to this job first because we had the dog. We were told up that the dog handler, because he's by himself, he always carries a, a pistol, which is generally unarmed in New Zealand. And uh, we got there first. But absolutely amazing uh, guys there. They have to be better police more switched on as police because they're dealing with a situation by themselves. And then you've got to look at the big situation because they've got to possibly track them and, and, and figure things out then as well. But that, does that sound about right? Same as you? Yo, I had a single purpose dog and I actually had him while I was in narcotics. So it's much different than 
and that type of uh, patrol. Oh, so, in okay. Patrol. Yep. Yeah, and I had them in patrol for the last year and a half of my career there, but the majority I was in narcotics. So I was in plain clothes with long hair, walking around with a dog. Oh wow! We're, we're good for surveillance. If I need to get, hey, we need someone to get clogged. Be around the corner and just walk. You know, walk guy walking a dog. You know. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So these um New Zealand doesn't have that so much. Um, they have uh, Alsatians. It's a colder climate there, so the German Shepherd. And uh, I have a German. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, Sorry, go ahead. beautiful dogs. Um, uh, and yeah, they they are um, with five men over there, and they they they're historically in New Zealand with unarmed police. They were used for armed situations, and, and a lot of time you had to sort of sacrifice the dog, and they saved many lives in in New Zealand. But the dog handlers, I just saw them as um, yeah, just really clever policemen and um, really clever operators, and they they just loved it, even to the the point of training the dogs that would help them sort of learn learn general behavior as well yeah yeah definitely the the, the canine behavior even just with sense and it's my, my dog was bred for dual purpose what i mean by that i don't know if they use the same terms but to do patrol work and apprehend but uh the, my agency that i worked for didn't want to hear much about that they tried to put that forward before and there's a lot of apprehension here about you know, someone gets bit by a dog in the U.S., they're suing for big money. Oh, and wow. <laughs> yeah. You get, yeah we, they um, get we the were, juries of them. Oh, I can, I can imagine. We were chasing down um, some car thieves. And this is interesting, you know, Friday night car thieves, you know, be real badasses. They always turn out to be kids. Jesus, you know. <laughs> I mean, kids, <laughs> kids, 15, 16, and the right. dog gets loose. And because we saw these saw shadows in the in the bush about 300 meters away 40 meters away let the dog off the leash and yeah two minutes later once we run up we found out that he's, he's bitten a 15 year old kid like, kids are criminal for sure but it's just one of those things that the kid has to sort of wear yeah it's a you know like you said you don't know and i had a couple of instances where i actually had to put my dog away and go run after somebody because he's not trained when he, he came from europe he came from hungary he, he was imprinted is the word I would use, you know, on biting a sleeve, but he hasn't completed training on that. Yep. And he was physically able to do so, but they didn't want to hear it. So I had to put him up a car and then go running after where, I mean, it would have been perfect, you know, just whoop, let him go. And, <laughs> and then we could go jump on him. And instead we're hopping fences and things like that and surrounding areas. It's just, yeah. yeah. It's uh Hey, good times. It was, it was really good learning. Now, Again, just maybe if we can tie a bow in your your whole journey, Marines, uh, police, canine, uh, and then you started your business while you're still in the job and, and you moved on. Um, how the hell did you find time to write a book? Because you're kind of busy. Yeah, it's when I'm in between doing things. That's one of those things where it's like in between, if I have downtime, just go to it. And then there were times I, I really had to be pretty disciplined about it and say, okay, I've got to spend this much this day. Here's two hour block this day. And just, but it became, I don't, I don't want to say the number one focus at the time, because I, I have a family and I had work and I was still traveling for courses, but I want to say it was one of the things I put a, an emphasis on. I want to get this done. Cause there's a lot of cops in the U S I, I can't get out to, yeah. you know, they, I'm, yeah. they're in real rural areas. I've had cops come to me after that my classes that came out and said, Hey, I read your book or I listened to a podcast because there's a street cop podcast as well. There's so there's somewhere I do, but and said, Hey, you know, things you went over. I saw like I had one guy who was in Oklahoma coming. He goes, Hey dude, because I really want to think I had to run because I had to catch a flight out of Dallas and like, Hey, listen, I don't want to waste your time. Cause I told him, I said, listen, I don't mean to be rude. I usually hang out after class, but I got to get going. And he goes, you know, and sometimes it happens with flights. I got to take off. He goes, Hey, you know, I just want to let you know, you saved me after hearing, I can, he might in the book or podcast, and I get emails and things like that. Hey, I recognize the behavior that you, you wrote about. I recognize it and I'll get after classes. So it's really rewarding to get that back, to know that, you know, it's not something you could quantify and say, oh, well, this saved this many cops from getting injured, but it, it's something I, I know it's out there and the information that it should be out there is getting out there as much as I, I can put it out there. Yeah, I'm stunned at, um, you know, someone will be watching the videos and so on 
uh, for a couple of years watching what you do and you don't even know them and then they'll tell you hey i did something that you talked about with this guy or i did something you did and it saved my life or it you know it got me out of this bad situation so i mean most of the shows i say if one thing someone hears in this show can help one person then it's, it's, it's done we've done our job but that's just so cool you you've got the book out there i mean uh an author is a, a pinnacle in, in my view. It's so time consuming. You got to get it out there. Beware the body. I mean, we're going to put in the show notes and I lead with um, a, a verbal intro anyway, Sean, but where can people find your book? You can go on Amazon. It's also audible. And there's, there's a, another audio as well. Cause it, I didn't realize how big audio was. Yeah. When I put huge. it out there. Yeah. When I put it out there, it was, I put in because I'm in Facebook groups and I have, you know, different social media for law enforcement around the, around the world, actually. And we put it out. A lot of people like, is it on audio? When's the audio? Audio, audio, audio. So then I had to go get somebody. They did the audio as well. So it's on Audible and a couple other. If, if you Google it, you'll find it. If you want on Amazon, you can get the Audible or you can get the it's also Kindle and the, the hard copy. Brilliant. Brilliant. I, I didn't realize it's an Audible. I'll get it down today. That's where I, I read just about every book I've got at the moment. Uh, can, can we just spend a couple minutes on the actual process? I mean, you had an idea to write. I'm assuming you had an idea to write a book. You, you started to maybe flesh some stuff out. How the hell did you actually get to write a book, have it published, and and get it out there? I mean, that's that's a process that's more than just someone teaching their skill. Oh, yeah. it's, it's I started out with the way my process was, was kind of an outline. There's a lot that I want to share. And there's a lot that you're like, I'm taking this out. Because mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was going to do a book on beware, because beware of the body's all in aggression detection, those pre-fight, pre-attack indicators. And I was like, should I do that as well as the, the lying? And I'm like, you know, that's not where my heart's at right now. This is stuff where, you know, if, if someone lies to you, could it end up turning bad? Of course, something could go wrong. But going home safe at the end of the day, if someone lies to me and leaves, of course, I don't want them to get over on me, but at the end of the day, you want to go home safe. You want other people to go home safe. Yep. And then I started writing it in with law enforcement in mind at first, but then I was like, you know, this is something that the general public can use as well. Crimes on the rise. I don't know how it is in Australia. I mean, the, the car thefts alone in the state that I'm in and the people trying to break into cars to look for the key fobs and leave. And, and now they're getting more brazen, but they're going into houses. They're yeah. breaking into houses, looking for the key fobs. Yeah. People are home. It's, you know, when the past, I don't want to say we'd have home invasions, you know, they, they occur, but usually a burglar breaks into a house, you know, as well as I do, they don't want anybody there. They want to get the stuff yeah. and go. Yeah. Now they're going in the middle of the night, trying, people are home. They want to get the stuff. They don't care. And it's one of those, now that's the home that obviously my book's not going to be able to assist you when you're at home in the middle of the night, besides situational awareness, but if you're out in public, you should be looking around. You should understand these basic indicators that someone might want to attack you. And everything has to be taken in context. Some people lift their pants up. I'm not going to be like this every time <laughs> someone lifts their pants right, or looks over their shoulder. It's um, it's interesting synchronicity. I'm, you know, I just launched my online course last week, and you've got your online um, or international training coming with the other other company but i'm thinking this the audio book be where the body could probably tie in really well and i might we might chat a little bit more after we finish recording about how they can add value to um to the how not to die courses because be your own bodyguard and if if you're a bodyguard if you're a secret service guy the last thing you want to do is get hands on with a guy you don't want a, a massive scuffle, uh, even worse, having to protect your your principal. You want to avoid that, and that's what we do. We planning and avoid, and nothing ever goes wrong. And the and the VIP has is none the wiser. We we turn down this street because we avoided that, but they don't know. We don't want to go into those situations. And sure, I can teach you a, a, as a listener how to how to chop throats and how to do all these fancy things we learn in the special forces, but. You don't want to do that with your kids around. You don't want to don't want to have that that it can it can go wrong. You know, what can go wrong will go wrong. So, 
I think your book, Beware the Body and, and Recognize Those Things, and I'm sure you've done a phenomenal job on situation awareness. I think it would be a great tie-in. And, and even if it's not for the course, I'm getting the book. I'm there to learn. And if I can teach one thing out of that to somebody to help them, brilliant. But I would suggest that that's absolutely brilliant tool for anybody listening to use and, and share with people because a lot of the time it's not us aware people that are listening to this show. It's their wife that's that's unaware. So give it to her to listen to a little clip and so on. I think it'd be really, really good. So I, I applaud you for, for getting that book published, which is phenomenal. And I'm really excited to, to check it out. Oh, great. Thank you. Look, um, Sean, I'd like to wrap up. It's It's been brilliant speaking to you. Really, um, just really organic, really fluent. And it's been yeah, a, a, a real eye-opener for what you do. I'm looking forward to to the book and and congratulations for um, getting your training out there during that lockdown period as well. Um, that must have been a, a real hurdle to work through. Um, and now you, the sort of leash is off. You can sort of sort of have free reign through the world and through the through the country there. Uh, where can we find more about you? Again, I'll put in the show notes and in the verbal intro. But where can we find um, details on you, Sean? If you go on, I have a private company that I started out with. I'm subcontracted by a street company. If you go on onefacetraining.com, that's yep. O-N-E-F-A-C-E training.com. Also, if you go on Sean Grogan's Body Language, an Instagram handle. And if you are in law enforcement, you can go for, you can, I have a Facebook group as well, Sean Grogan's Body Language for Law Enforcement. Awesome. I'll put those links in. Your website's slick, man. Uh, you know, it was a while, I think it was almost two months ago, we organized uh, connecting for this show and your website is slick. I, I love it. Um, so kudos to you on that as well. Those links will be the show notes for everybody. Um, yep. Excited to get the book. Been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, you Sean, and uh, I'm, I'm going to pick your brains a bit more. Sound good. Thanks, Damien. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolute pleasure. Thank you. Hi. I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces Operator, High Performance Living Coach from HowNotToDie.com.au. And you can listen to my Straight Talk Mind and Hustle podcast, sponsored by RealKetonesAustralia.com, the best and most effective ketone supplement on the market to reduce anxiety, enhance brain performance, and supply twice as much energy as glucose. Thanks for watching.